and can I take this opportunity to welcome you to the online educator debate. My name is Harold Ellotson and I'm going to be chairing the debate this evening. And uh, this is going to be a parliamentary style debate and that's why we've got the bar open still. As anybody who's ever been near a parliament will know that they are full of alcoholics. So do help yourself to a drink, um, certainly before the start of things and uh, feel free to go and have something. I think the bar will be open throughout the debate, so this is certainly very like the House of Commons. Um, the weather forecast tonight is for um, storms, strong winds of 110 kilometers an hour outside, and I think uh, the, the weather inside is going to be even more stormy, so I suspect that we're going to reach up to 300 kilometers an hour during this debate. This is one of the most controversial issues affecting education today, and it's one which has certainly been very much a part of, uh, of this conference already and will continue to be tomorrow as well, something that crops up throughout the conference. And I know that there are very strong opinions on either side, um, the way this debate is going to work is that we've got four speakers for a motion, two speakers on either side. I'm going to ask them to speak for about 10 minutes each, and then I'm going to throw the discussion over, op open to the floor to all of you, so you will then have uh, your opportunity to make a short contribution, a short, short, I emphasize, contribution, a few remarks, a question, uh, make a little comment and let us know what you think. And I'll also, if you feel particularly strongly about something that they are saying during their speech, I will let you ask them if they mind if you interrupt them and make a short contribution or ask them a question during that. They don't have to take your intervention, but you, you might decide that if they don't, they've got something to hide. So it's up to you. But in any event, I'm, going to, I'm here to ensure fair play, so I don't want any lynching happening tonight. So I'm going to make sure that, uh, that you know, there are, there's plenty of chance for you to express your views either during what they have to say or more particularly afterwards. And I'm also going to allow them to intervene on each other if they feel that that's appropriate. The motion tonight is uh, this House believes that MOOCs are doomed. And uh, perhaps they will, the proposition will will outline to you exactly what constitutes uh, doom in this context, uh, because that may be open to question. Um, but perhaps, and it's not up to me to say, perhaps it means can they survive in a meaningful form or are they part of a, of a fad? Do they really work or are they just a poor substitute for real learning? And can they deliver what they promise or will they fail because of their own economic model? These are all the sort of questions that we are going to look at this evening. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to call on the first of our speakers, who is Crispin Weston, who is um, an educational technologist specializing in data collection and who is also uh, a well-known blogger, well-known and controversial blogger. So, over to you, Crispin. Crispin is going to speak for the motion. Those of you who are British may remember Gerald Ratner. He was chief executive of Ratner's, which was a jewellery chain, until he made an online speech in which he said that when people asked him how Ratner's could sell their stuff, stuff so cheap, he always told them, because it's total crap. <laughs> Our earrings cost less than a Marks and Spencer's prawn sandwich, but probably wouldn't last as long. And the day after the speech, uh, half a billion pounds was wiped off Ratner's share price. Uh, three weeks ago, Sebastian Thrun, the godfather of the ex-MOOC, did a, did a Ratner. In an online uh, interview, he said that at Udacity, we have a lousy product. And just like the first Ratner, he didn't tell us anything that we didn't know already. <laughs> because we already knew that on average, less than 10% of people who subscribe to a MOOC complete it, even though 60 or 70% of them already had a degree before they started. And that's just data for a single MOOC, not a whole degree. 
And it's for a test which is marked by computer or fellow students, not by an expert looking for creativity or insight or originality. So I'm not going to argue here that MOOCs are not working because that seems to me to be obvious. <laughs> and it's not what we're debating here tonight. Because we're not debating whether MOOCs are working, we're debating whether they will work. And the reason they won't work, the reason they can't work, the reason that MOOCs are doomed, is because they're predicated on two flawed pedagogies. The first is all about social networking, and this lies at the heart of the connectivist CMOOCs. Connectivism um, says that just as the brain is a collection of neurons, so on the internet we can have a super brain in which we are the neurons. Um, and uh, knowledge isn't something that you acquire. It isn't even something that as individuals we construct. It's something we participate in. So it's not surprising uh, that the, the connectivist MOOCs that have been run are nearly all about connectivism. Um, because why would you want to know about anything else? Why would you want to learn about uh, particle physics? Um, that just shows that you don't really understand what knowledge is. Knowledge is the network. Um, so it's, um, I think we need to forget about connectivism, but you may say that there's a more general theory of social learning, uh, which is very common. We've all heard lots of talk about Web 2.0 uh, and the wisdom of the crowd. But what's interesting about uh, the enthusiasm for wisdom of the crowd, that most of the people who uh, advocate the wisdom of the crowd don't seem to have read the book. The Wisdom of Crowds uh, by James Shurowetsky is not an argument for consensual social networks. It's an argument for markets and betting shops. Uh, he says that good collective decisions are the product of disagreement and contest, what we're doing here tonight, not consensus or compromise. The best way for a group to be smart is for each person in it to think and act as independently as possible. But thinking and acting independently is difficult. It's what a liberal education is all about. Uh, by nature, people tend to be deferential towards authority, towards tradition, and particularly towards their peer group. And these tendencies are reinforced by social networks. You don't get a lot of followers on Twitter by tweeting things that no one agrees with. Um, and so, where, where the network is composed, where the crowd is composed of conformists, it is not wise. Um, and so it's no surprise to see online comments such as one that was le uh, left on Sebastian Thrun's recent article, which says from a MOOC student, the forums are no help, and the amount of bad advice from other students is equal to the good. The second ineffective pedagogy is standalone exposition, the dissemination of information. Uh, this has been tried for 30 or 40 years, and we know that it's never worked in the past. And we know from the MOOC data and from, from Sebastian Thrun that it's not working at the moment. And we know that it won't work in the future because we know that education isn't about acquiring information. It's about acquiring skill and expertise. As Professor Diana Lorillard of the Institute of Education said in London, uh, of the technology opportunists uh, who advocate do-it-yourself online learning, an academic education is not equivalent to a trip to the public library, digital or otherwise. Of two, the two pedagogies that MOOCs currently use, social networking, uh, and standalone exposition, neither are sufficient to support formal education. So the argument boils down to whether MOOCs uh, will be able to develop new pedagogies. But before we decide whether that's going to be possible or plausible, we need to ask what it is they're actually trying to do. Because it's not as if we don't already know um, how you develop expertise. You develop it by practice and feedback. You learn to ride a bike by getting on a bike and falling off a bike, by engaging in a feedback loop with that thing which you could call an instructive other. And when you come to abstract academic disciplines, uh, you learn by what a 19th century educationist called making mental efforts under criticism. And the best source of criticism is a human expert. Um, that's the model proposed to us by Socrates over 2,000 years ago. That's the model still used by the tutorial system at Oxford and Cambridge, neither of which have touched MOOCs with a barge pole. And that's not because they're elite institutions protecting their privilege. Um, a recent survey showed that 40% of children who went to state school in London have private tuition at home. 40%. It's because that's what works. 
but only 9% in Wales, where people are not as wealthy as they are in London. And you'll find precious little Socratic dialogue going on in most schools and universities, because there simply aren't enough Socrateses to go round. The problem with traditional education is not one of quality. It's one of scale. But in attempting to scale straight to massive in one giant leap, we're abandoning the one thing that we know works, which is expert personalized tuition. That's why long-standing online education programs like the Open University never abandoned personal tuition. And it's why they never delivered education any more cheaply than face-to-face. -face. Instead of scaling to massive, we should be a little bit more modest and move to blended learning using technology not to replace the human teacher, but to amplify and extend the reach of the good teacher. And there are three ways that we can do that. First, we can use social networking technology, but not as advocated by the, by the uh, connectivists and the Twitterati, um, but rather to support structured, supervised, purposeful peer-to-peer -peer conversations. Second, we can use machine instruction in ways that go well beyond multiple choice. We need games, simulations, creative tools, Seymour Papert's microworlds, uh, activities that require students to make mental efforts under criticism, where that criticism, criticism comes not just from teachers and peers, but also where that criticism can be automated or where, where it is intrinsic in the activity they, they are undertaking. And thirdly, we need systems that aggregate and manage the four other pedagogical approaches, human tuition, peer instruction, machine instruction, and exposition. We need learning analytic systems, activity sequences, assignment managers, e-portfolio tools. We need a whole raft of education-specific software, and we hardly have any of it. <coughs> because in spite of billions of pounds that have been poured into education technology by several governments, all we have done, in the words of Diana Lorillard again, has been to appropriate everybody else's technologies. And we need our own technology to match our own requirements. As a Financial Times article in July commented, the real innovation is in the software and the analytical tools that underpin it. Now, if education was just a matter of social networking, if all we required was a clever algorithm and lots of servers, then the MOOC platforms would be able to develop the technology that we need, as they're trying to do at the moment. But education isn't like that. We need a whole raft. We need an extensive set of software that uh, models the complex activities, transactions, processes, and information that is involved in the business of education. And that is not going to be provided by a MOOC platform. It's not going to be provided by practitioners, by teachers and lecturers. What we need to provide that is a new education technology industry. When we look back in 10 years' time, I think we'll say that the MOOCs were very, very important because they helped, they presided over the birth of that industry. And they, their main contribution, I think, is that they will have asked the right question. How do we scale education? And as we realize the huge importance of that, on which hangs the individual fulfillment of all our citizens, um, the cohesion of our societies, and the performance of our economies, I think we'll realize that the MOOCs had been doomed all along because the question they asked was one to which they themselves didn't have an answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Crispin. Our next speaker who's going to speak against the motion is Professor Pierre Dillonbourg, who is the Professor of Learning Technologies at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, and he's also the Academic Director of the Centre for Digital Education in Switzerland. Thank you, and thank you very much, Crispin, because my son told me I want to become a blogger. No, I know what is a blogger. No, it's not a job. You repeat what Sebastian Trun said last week, and that's your job. So thank you very much. I can explain to my son why he should not become a blogger. But, Crispin, I don't want to be nasty with you, neither with you, Jan Pierron, neither with Sebastian, because I feel the pain. These people suffer. Yeah, and I suffered as well. I was seven years old, and I was making my list to Santa Claus. And I was there, and suddenly I saw 
my father was bringing the gift of Santa Claus. I realized Santa Claus does not exist. <laughs> you remember? That was a painful day. And these poor guys, you know, a bit later in their life, they realize Santa Claus does not exist. Sebastian Trun, there is no miracle in education. You know, there was this idea by this guru of the MOOC that thanks to the MOOCs, education will be free for all. You know, all students will be motivated. Knowledge will be available to the world. And teachers will be passionate. Come on. That's not the MOOC, the problem, you know. If this was true, MOOCs would be forbidden by the CIA or somebody like that. No, no, come on, this was not a problem of MOOCs. This was a problem of the gurus, you know. Now, after one year, the gurus get tired and they leave. They say, okay, no, that was not a good idea. We go somewhere else. No, let's be serious. Education is difficult. Ladies and gentlemen, every ambitious educational project is difficult. We have problems, okay? Not only with MOOCs. Talk about your campus. Don't you have problems on your campus? Of course, we have a lot of problems. Why would MOOCs change education in an easy way? Because so the problem is not the MOOCs. The problem is the overstatement that some of these people made about MOOCs. So I want to be honest, because I think there should be one honest person tonight on the table. <laughs> so I even killed my, my partner there. <laughs> so if you agree, as a Swiss citizen, I have to be honest. So, um, <laughs> Problems. We have a lot of problems. So at EPFL, we have 20 MOOCs, uh, 300 online students. Uh, it works well, but we have a lot of problems. Plagiarism? No. Massive means massive plagiarism. The second one is flipped classes. We all agree that flipped class is the world worries. It's difficult. No. A MOOC is quite easy. You give a lecture, you record a lecture. But flipped class, you have to rethink completely your teaching. We have success, but we have failure. To be honest, we have problems. Um, privacy. Our students are upset. You know, all the data are in the cloud. You know, there is no cloud. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no Santa Claus and there is no cloud. <laughs> there is no computer in the cloud. You know, they are somewhere in the desert of Arizona and in the back office of, of the NSA. So, and that was before. Our students were upset even before the, end of the Snowden story. So that's a problem. How are you going to cope with this privacy issue? The cost is an issue, let's be honest. And finally, the workload. All the teachers at EPFL who did the MOOC to say, Pierre, that was a fantastic experience. Never again. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge workload. So we have problems. So what? What do you do when you have problems? You say, OK, it was not a good idea. No, come on. Imagine, you are in Zermatt. You know Zermatt in Switzerland, at the bottom of Matteron? You are there, it's the morning, and, and say, what am I going to do today? I could do some shopping in the street of Zermatt, the street of Paris, the street of London, or I could climb the Matteron, the most beautiful mountain, you know, the mountain, not a mountain. And so you have the choice. You can go an easy walk, take no risk, have no problem, and OK. Or you can decide to climb the Matteron. It will be difficult. You might fail. Yes, you might fail. You will have problems. You will have difficulties. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the choice. Do some shopping in Paris or try to climb the Matteron. Okay? <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. No. I, I should not, I, maybe I'm not so clear. When I mention Paris, maybe it's not clear for all. It's a city in the north of France, in the suburbs of Brussels, so that everybody knows where is Paris. So, Crispin said MOOCs do not work. Okay, let's be serious a minute now with numbers. I said we have 300,000, we had in one year 300,000 online registration. This is fake numbers, okay? We all know it, okay? The number of registration has to be divided by two or three to have the real number of participants. This is fake numbers, but there is no reason why since all Americans use these fake numbers, there is no reason why we should be more honest than the Americans when we talk about it. So, real numbers, I propose that we stop using the number of registration. It doesn't mean anything. 50,000 students get an EP, a certificate after doing a very difficult EPFL online course. 50,000 students. Some people don't like numbers, but 50,000. Come on, if you don't like numbers, do, 
no, leave academia. 50,000, and it was not an easy MOOC, you know. It's not a MOOC for bloggers, you know. It was a MOOC. <laughs> Seven weeks. You, the first slide is mathematics from the left to the right. It's all mathematics that you prefer. Seven hours per week for seven weeks, and they managed to get a, a, a certificate. So that's a number. We have 10,000 students on campus. We multiply it by five for one course only. So this number speak to the Minister of Education. You know, He will call you. He know that there is something going on. And if you don't care about the, your Minister of Education, OK, then you can forget about numbers. But from time to time, you have to convince him. But we have also very nice stories about what's going on, because besides number, and my favorite story is the following one. Last week, we had a, a big debate in our professor. Some of them are against MOOCs. Some, some of them were in favor of MOOCs. And one lady told us, you know, really, I did not like the idea of MOOC. I like the contact with my students. I really like it. But I must say one thing. Usually, after two hours lecture, I have this exercise. And during the exercise session, I discuss with the students, and then I realize. They ask me a question, I say, come on, I told you that one hour ago. And they had forgotten everything I said in my lecture, one hour later. And she said, no, they do the MOOC, they have the time to digest, and then they apply the knowledge. And you know, in academia, at university, you know, they learn during the exercise, they listen during the lecture, but the real place for learning is during the exercise session. So if the only achievement of MOOCs was that we improve the efficiency of exercise session on campus, that would justify all the investment. Which investment? About half a million, 50,000 students, 100 hours on the MOOCs. So it makes an investment of 10 cents per hour per student. Not bad. I mean, to do high quality education, 10 cents per hour, it's not bad. So. Should we be critical against MOOC? Yes. We should not believe. We are scientists. We count data, we collect data, we count data, we analyze data. We should not believe, we should be critical. But there are two ways to be critical. One is to be critical from outside, say, this is bad, I don't want to be involved in that. Or one is to step in and try to, to be on board and try to drive the evolution of MOOCs. The future of MOOCs is not predicted. The future of MOOCs is what we will invent, or we will use them, or we will flip the class, or we will control the quality of the MOOCs, or we will make them cheaper. It's not written. If you want MOOCs to be successful, we just want to collectively make MOOC successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Giampiero Petrilieri, who is Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior at INSEAD, and he is going to second the motion. Giampiero. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say, how, how, how do you follow Pierre? I want to say it's absolutely right. I mean, to have this illusion in Santa Claus, to be swept away by something that doesn't exist, you could be forgiven for that because so many, it happens to so many. Such a powerful narrative held by powerful people among people that do not know better. And they are told that, they're, that they will make their life happier. You should be forgiven for believing in Santa Claus for 12 to 18 months, even if it is a crushing disappointment, Santa Claus doesn't exist. You should be a little bit more critical of the people that wear a Santa suit and go on the internet promising gift to everyone and then just bring them to the kids that have the most toys. <laughs> That's what we should be fitting about. And that is, frankly, the data we have. Um, I'll be honest, I, I'm not a blogger, although I do write uh, blogs on occasion, and I have publicly declared myself uh, a MOOC conscientious objector. And, um, and the reason I... I have is because I'm fascinated, I love technology, and I think technology can enhance learning. However, I think we have to wonder whether MOOCs aren't a band-aid over a gushing wound in public education. Let me ask you a question. Are you enjoying your wine? <laughs> Are you having a great time? It's nice to be warm and cozy, snowing outside, to be here with each other with a good drink. Cheers. <laughs> I'm not drinking. Let me ask you, given the choice, would you rather be here watching this 
in our company, drinking your wine, looking forward to the dance tonight? Or would you be given the choice, or would you be at home watching this live streamed on your computer? And this isn't live streamed anyway, it's a MOOC debate that's actually <laughs> private. Um, well, given the choice, how many of you would rather be here than home? Raise your hand. Good, that's interesting. Now let me ask you, wait, no that's not demagogy, let me ask you, let me ask you the question, let me ask you, let me ask you the question Pierre would ask. Given the choice, how many of you would choose watching it on your computer instead of not having a chance to watch it at all? Raise your hand. Absolutely. Now let me ask you a question. When did we start giving up? When did we start giving up? and making the comparison with nothing for education rather than with the best quality. You made it. When did we start? I made it, of course, because I think in many ways the whole conversation about MOOCs have been, MOOCs are very interesting and they're very valuable. They're an incredible enhancement of education. They're an incredible complement. But the whole conversation, frankly, has been how are they going to substitute education? You know, we are in the age where we have the cult of disruption. And, but just because everything could be disrupted doesn't mean that everything should be disrupted. And let me say, this particular disruption to me seems to me, and I've made this point, and it's, been, uh, it's a bit controversial, seems to be a little bit less like real disruption, which is when outsiders really come and take over a powerful but somewhat um, resistant incumbent, which is the kind of disruption Clay Christensen talks about, but it reminds me of a different kind of disruption, which is the disruption of colonialism, which is when a powerful center, which has cultural appeal and access to superior technology, tries to overextend its reach into peripheries that are struggling and whose authorities are being questioning. And of course, it's tremendously charming because it's offering an illusion. It's offering an incredible illusion, which is the illusion of access. But MOOCs don't provide access. I'll be, they provide access to the minimum common denominator of learning. Come on, let's look at each other. We've been learning professionals. For 30 years in the learning professions, we've been saying learning is much more than the transmission of facts and the acquisition of facts. There's a social component to learning. It's giving people access to culture, to communities. It's helping them not just acquire something and makes them better at a certain job is giving them the space and the opportunity to imagine themselves differently. Not just a few people, but everyone. That's the idea of education as a public good, as a human right. We weren't talking about education as a business model or not. Now, of course, we have betrayed that. I mean, we should be honest. I think in the educational industries, we should say, we have betrayed that, and we have tremendous problems. We have problems of capacity, we have problems of efficiency, we have problems of cost. Is that a reason to abdicate and say, you know, let's let the venture capitalists and the elite institutions and uh, powerful donors tell us how to do it? Or is this an opportunity to say, okay, how do we use this as an opportunity for us to blend, you know, what we do with what we need to do. Because let's look at the data. I mean, I haven't, I will, I'll admit it, I haven't taken a MOOC, although I've taught and taken um, various other forms of online learning, and I've really learned a lot. I learned a tremendous amount from social media also. Um, but let's just admit it, the data is very daunting. And it's, what I'm not daunted is not the 7 to 10 percent completion rates of most of the major MOOCs, because in terms of, you know, what these things are, they're really lectures. And lectures, even before they went online, they're, they're always been better as an advertisement for knowledge than actually as a means to acquire it. And so in the online world, if you compare them to Google Ads, 7 to 10 percent is actually not no, that no, bad. No, this is wrong. This is wrong. 10 percent of those who who come to the first time, you, you compare the finalists to those who register, but you should not take into account those who never show up. That's not the real numbers. Fair enough. That's not the real number. So the people, at, it's, it's right, it's an education where admissions don't count. You see? It's, it's up to you. It's up to you. So let's look a little bit at that. Who is the ideal learner of these MOOCs? We know who the ideal learner is. We have the data. Actually, the learners who most enjoy the MOOCs are people with um, higher education degrees who are very self-motivated, who are actually enjoy learning for learning's sake, and frankly, look a whole lot 
like the people on this panel, <laughs> which isn't the most diverse panel I've frankly been on. <laughs> that wasn't what education used to be about. Education used to be about opportunity. I love when MOOCs show that they can actually provide someone opportunity to be on this panel that wouldn't otherwise have it. But let's look at the research. A colleague of mine, um, Professor Kaiser Snellman at INSEAD, looking at differences, not in adults, but in children. It turns out that there's a tremendous and increasing gap in educational opportunities going on in children between three to seven year olds. What happens is children from medium, middle and, war, and upper class families spend a lot more time with their parents. Their parents help them learn, spend more money on extracurricular activities. They end up trusting teachers and therefore they go to school already prepared to make the most of education. Children from working class families instead spend less time with pa their parents, spend less time engaging in learning activities and actually are trusting institutions less and less so that when they arrive to the educational environment they actually have a very hard time engaging with their teachers. These are the people for whom a teacher can be profoundly transformational, not because they're teaching them to count, but because they're teaching them there is room for you here. And the way education is transformational for these people is not by saying, it's okay, you don't trust institutions, but maybe you can look at them at a further distance. It's actually welcoming them. You see, we are talking about access when we really have a tremendous issue of inclusion. I had the research from another colleague of mine, Arminia Ibarra, talks about, for example, what does the, do the network look like of different people? We know that majority groups have very diverse networks. They don't need to go to institutions like ours to acquire diverse networks. But minority groups, they tend to have networks that are called homophilic, which is they're very tight and they're actually mostly with people that look and think like that. And those are the people from whom education can be tremendously transformational because it exposes them from, to people who are different from them. It gives them one thing. It's not facts and knowledge and skills. It gives them the courage to question. And that's what the best education does. Entitled people get that courage very early on. They are taught from the very beginning that you can trust authority enough that you can say, I don't know in front of it, and they will treat you benevolently. They have the privilege of getting the outcome of great education, which is not fact, but it's actually curiosity. And by the way, this is not about the humanities. You know, you don't need to read Hamlet to know that questioning is important. This is the scientific method. While people that come from less privileged background might risk not having access to the kind of education that actually gives them the courage to question and engage with the other, but it only gives them the skills and the fact, but actually leaves them always having to prove that they have to look like someone else. And that is something that I think MOOCs may crack. I'm not saying they might not crack it, but right now the data show they aren't cracking it. So to have a conversation just about the transmission of knowledge and then fall prey of the rhetoric of the democratization of education seems to be a big, um, you know, slightly incongruent. I think we should have the courage to say, you know, this is a great, this is someone actually, and I'm going to conclude with a fantastic point that one of you made. I don't know where you are, Piotr, but I think you're absolutely right. MOOCs are a win-win, good learning, e he, I, think he, I think you're a he, he tweeted it. Um, good learning if you're motivated and good marketing if you're professionals. And he's taken three MOOCs, so he knows what he's talking about, um, unlike me. And I think it's true. Those are two very big ifs. And I think we have to ask ourselves, who can afford the motivation and who can afford the professionalism? And not just say, well, I'm sorry for everyone else, but keep struggling for our higher aim, which is to think about how do we increase the access to everyone else. That's me. Okay, thank you very much, Jean Piero. Our next speaker who is going to uh, speak against the motion is uh, Johannes Heinlein, who is Senior Director of Strategic Partnerships at edX 
in the USA, which is an educational startup by Harvard and MIT. Johannes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harold, and thank you to the previous speakers. I feel a little inclined to go, what now? Um, going last has its advantages. Going last has its disadvantages. It has its disadvantages that I had wonderful notes. They're not going to cut it, I guess. <laughs> it has its advantage because I can demystify some of the myths that our traditional folks, you just look at the ties. Um, <laughs> no, and that's, that's really, unfortunately, that's all the criticism of MOOCs traditionally comes from traditionalists. Well, evolution isn't about tradition. Evolution is about change, and MOOCs are about change. So let me talk a little bit about facts. Wants to intervene May I object that. to that? He I mean, wanted to take off his tie before. Frankly, <laughs> frankly, I thought about that, but I think that's a, good, that's a good sign of the provincialism of the techno-utopianist, which is, you know, when is, it's only a concern with function rather than with aesthetics. It's not just what works, but it's also what's beautiful. When did we lower the bar and why? Well, that, you're absolutely right, actually. Okay. <laughs> You're actually absolutely right. And, and so I thought I, I demystify some of the things that uh, the two wonderful speakers who are speaking for um, this wonderful motion um, just simply got wrong. And that's it. They simply are wrong. So, first of all, I loved your example, Jim Pierre, about would people rather be here in person or would they sit at home in front of the computer? Well, that's wonderful for us privileged people who are willing to ha pay a thousand euros or have organization who pay money. 90% of the world population, actually I think it's 99.9% .9 can't afford to sit here. And that's the same with education. The la vast majority of the world's population cannot afford to attend wonderful educational institutions. So access is extremely important, and that's what MOOCs provide, access. Access to educational resources, to quality educational resources for free. What does access give us? Access gives us data. What does data do? Data helps us improve pedagogical research. It helps us to analyze. It helps us to work in a federated model where people from across the world get together to improve educational outcomes. And educational outcomes are improved on a daily basis. Access drives what we do on a daily basis as MOOC providers. And that's not just true for edX, that's true for others as well. What that means is that one lousy product, as Crispin said, does not equate to many lousy products. And you were mentioning that those highly esteemed organizations like Cambridge and Oxford have not jumped into the fold of MOOCs. I'm afraid to tell you that there are quite a number of faculty members at Cambridge University using MOOC products to improve their teaching on campus. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but that's the fact. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is you're using technology in a blended environment. And my point is that when you have a blended environment, you don't have massive, because that is in combination with personal tuition. That is actually true. Well, nice point. However, <laughs> They're using this product because the product has been improved through the data and through the research that's being done on a massive scale. People on a massive scale want to participate and in actual fact improve their lives through access. I'll tell you one personal story. Um, not for me personal, but um, we have Batushik, who was a 15-year-old high school student from Mongolia. He took three edX classes and he's a 15-year-old high school student, again, 15 years old, taking MIT advanced classes. He got a perfect score first time around. In the second class, he got a perfect score. In the third class, he got an almost perfect score. But Tushik, in the middle of Mongolia, would have never, ever had access to those kind of resources, to that kind of engagement with 150,000 fellow students from around the world in discussion forums. Direct access through connectiveness in networks, yes, networks work sometimes, with engaging with people. 
You know Weber Tushik, he's now 17 years old, is today. He's studying at MIT. So that is a story of success. That's just one story of success. But these stories are all over. And in the end, how do you measure success? And that's where I think a big disconnect happens here. The, critis, the critics of MOOCs always say success really is driven by everybody completing a course. That's not success. Success in learning is embracing new concepts, learning something new, engaging with others. That to me is success in learning. Yes, of course, ideally we want everybody to complete a degree, have a perfect education at Cambridge or wherever it might be, but that's not the reality. Over 80% of the learners of MOOCs take a MOOC because they want to embrace new concepts of learning. They want to engage with others. Another personal story, I took a MOOC and, and quite frankly I find it quite disconcerting that someone talks about MOOCs who's never taken a MOOC. Sorry about that. <laughs> but saying that, you know, what we have here is people who take MOOCs engage in ways that they normally would never have had. We had this course on global poverty. It's a wonderful subject and in a very important subject. Now, what happened in this class? 70,000 students from across the world got together, were formed into smaller groups and cohorts, worked together on a wiki, and developed integrated solutions to how they might overcome poverty issues in countries around the globe. Tell me how you're going to do that in a traditional context. How are you going to get together all of these people, all of these bright minds from all of these different locations without giving the tools to do so? You simply can't. And in this course, what we did is we brought together people who live in Africa and South America in Asia and North America in Europe, and we paired them up together and they developed really fascinating insights. And one of the greatest things that happened to me is as I followed these forums and I looked at the discussions that were going on, is how students at the esteemed institution that I come from at Harvard, who of course know everything, those students, came back afterwards and said, you know, I took this course, this MOOC course, and I really learned a lot more than I ever have in the same class on campus. Because I spoke to people who experienced poverty firsthand. I experienced and engaged with people in ways that I never did on campus because all I have on campus is privileged, extremely bright people. And that again is the power of MOOCs, the engagement and connectiveness works. And I'll finish with the last example of why connectiveness works. Um, I heard a lot of speakers today talk about their families and young children. So I have a young son, he's 10, 10 years old. And I have a daughter as well. But I'm talking about my son right now. So my son, I'm sorry, I talk about my daughter. <laughs> my daughter is seven years old. And, and actually, you know, to some extent it works maybe for her as well. What they do, and, and I'm just by show of hands, how many of you have children? Okay. How many of your children have used an iPad or an iPhone or a tablet? Yeah, pretty much everybody's hand who went up the first time around went up the second time around. You know, as parents, we might say it's evil, it's not good, it's technology, we don't want them to use it, but it comes in handy sometimes on a car ride or whatever it is. But that's not the story. So my son plays online games, not, not the fighting kind, Minecraft and, and other games, Lego games, and he actually plays with people overseas. He plays, we live in the US, he plays with his cousins in Germany, he plays with friends in New Zealand, and he plays with people in Asia. And he's learning things. And after he plays those games, he comes up to me and says, hey, I didn't realize this is what, how they did things overseas. And that to me is learning. That is engaging with others. And again, MOOCs allow us to learn, engage with others, be successful, and through access, data, and in the end, analytical frameworks in a federated model where people come together and work together and share as an open source technology information, that's what makes us successful and that's why MOOCs are here to stay.
Okay, thank you, Johannes, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, I suppose I'd better loosen my tie and undo my <laughs> collar button just to show that I am uh, impartial. Um, I'm neither a traditionalist nor a, a radical, um, but I'm here to keep the peace, basically. So um, it's over to you now. It's your turn to let us know what you think, and you can express yourselves in whatever way you like. You can do it in song if you want. The only thing I would ask, it doesn't matter if you're boring, but um, do try to be brief, because that's the only thing that I will clamp down on, is if you ramble on. So just be aware of that. But we've got time for about, ha about half an hour of comments, questions, and contributions. Yes, yeah, Leo in the front row. Yeah, can you just wait, by the way, everybody, wait before, until the microphone comes, and can you just introduce yourself and say where you're from? Leonardo de Arrizabalaga y Prado, from Madrid, Spain, um, and can you all hear now? No. 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 Put the mic Nera. Nera. now do you hear? Leonardo de Arrizabalaga y Prado, from Madrid, Spain, and... Uh, what I was going to say is the, the proposition, the motion, seems to be misframed because it's a, it's a statement of predictive future fact, whereas actually what has been debated is a value question. Are MOOGs a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, but that's beside the point. What I wanted to ask really is, Crispin, um, of the various theories of mind that exist, and I'm not going to enumerate all of them, but you mentioned connectivism, there's also, of course, associationism, the computational theory, etc. Which, if any, do you think is relevant to learning skills as opposed to merely collecting information? Well, I would say that learning skills um, is about, as I've said, engaging in iterative um, feedback loops. And I think that is the heart, or at the heart of, of education. So, I mean, if you look at Piaget, in, uh, you, can, you can look at Piaget in those terms. Uh, you bump up against the environment, and you either assimilate it or, or you accommodate it. Um, I think that is at the heart of, of what we should be doing as educators. And I, it, my problem is the lack of interactivity with expertise in MOOCs. Okay. I'll just let uh, Pierre comment on that. Yeah, I cannot let a, a British guy talking about Piaget, right? So, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just a common misunderstanding about MOOCs. When we talk about MOOCs, we talk about the video, okay? All the time we talk about the video. It's a small salient part of the iceberg. But students spend one hour, one hour and a half maybe on the video, and then five hours on the assignment on the problem solving. So the quality of learning in a MOOC can be totally Piagetian. I mean, if, if a MOOC designer invents a nice problem solving activity in the MOOC, it's there. But to know it, you have to, to go into the MOOC in, in, and do the assignment. If you just watch the video, you will not notice this pedagogical quality. So some MOOCs will be extremely bad, of course. MOOCs are like, like teachers, very good MOOCs, very bad MOOCs. But you can do a fantastic Piaget and MOOC if you integrate between the videos rich learning activities. Where's the feedback? Well, in some environment there is um, a very rich feedback that can be given by the system. If you play with a complex simulation, for instance, yeah. you can have a discovery learning activity with a rich feedback. Mm. In other cases, the, the feedback is social. Not only peer grading, but also feedback, marginal feedback from the peer, like peer reviewing of your papers. So you are right that in some case, when there is this peer grading, we notice that students give good, right grades, but with a low quality of feedback. That's one case. When it's really grade my exercise, the other students do not spend much time giving detailed feedback. But for the rest, the possibility to have rich social feedback in these online activities is there. OK. Let's have another question from the floor. Who else would like to? Yes. In the, the the man in the beige-looking jumper in the middle there. That's it. Thank you. And I don't have a tie. Uh, actually, it's not a question. It's a comment. I think we have misplaced the whole thing about MOOCs. We accuse uh, 
Siemens and Downs of being the, the creators of the MOOCs. And as you know, uh, Siemens recently stated that he's away from that. Sebastian Thurn also has said that uh, his project Udacity failed. California State University San Jose recently had an experiment. They didn't call it a MOOC, but it was everybody understood it was a MOOC, and it failed because it was predictable that the population they chose for that MOOC was the population that would fail. High school students that fail English, college students that fail English, and they put them in a MOOC to study English, and it failed. So I think that the problem that we have is that we are concentrating too much on terminology. We are calling something MOOCs, and we are hanging on on MOOCs. We should be thinking about online learning. And online learning is a lot of different things in not a MOOC. And we can have 10,000 students, 1,000 students, 300 students, as edX is doing in, in, in Harvard. Harvard. But uh, let's not call these MOOCs anymore, please. Okay, thank you for that. Right at the back, standing up by the wall. Yeah. Down there. Hi, my name is Herman van der Merwe. I'd like to ask a question to the panel. Uh, what is the business model of a MOOC? Uh, and in short, how are we going to make money with MOOCs? Okay, can, can, what's the business model of a MOOC and how are we going to make money with MOOCs? Okay. So do you, um, do you want to answer that very briefly first? I'll be curious about his answer. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so you don't have an answer. <laughs> okay. Do you I have an answer? Yeah, they're, they're, they're different. You know, they're different models. Essentially, and I'm sorry, this is going to sound like a business talk, but essentially, they're business to consumer um, models and channels of uh, generating revenues, and they're business to business models of generating revenue. Business to consumer means that you access, at the moment at least, most MOOC providers provide free access to the courses, but you charge for a certificate at the end. That's one way to generate revenue, and there are other value-added services like potential engagement, come to the university, offer scholarships, and so on and so on. That's the business-to-consumer side or business-to-learner. Business-to-business side is we already have a large number of corporations, NGOs, and governments using open-source platforms and non-open-source platforms, MOOC platforms, for the use of providing information. Many of those pay money for that. They want to license courses from institution and so on. So that's generating revenue as well. So, and there are multiple channels that would exceed the time I have right now. But essentially, there are revenues to be made. That's not okay. one. Um, no, one. because I think we want to try and get some more comments and questions. Yeah, another one on the, on the right-hand side there. Uh, Mitchell Stevens, Stanford University. Terrific debate, thank you. Uh, I'm, I was surprised that the critics of MOOCs did not uh, raise the, I think, deep problem that a, a MOOC is a course. And we inherit the course as, a, as an intellectual and temporal unit from a 20th century uh, model of, of time and content. Uh, and I w was wondering if any of the panelists might want to uh, add that to their critique, and might I also suggest that this debate raise the question next year of perhaps the course as an academic unit is doomed. Uh, very okay. very okay. quickly, I, I couldn't agree more. Certainly, um, I'd rather get rid of the word MOOCs and call it massive open online content rather than courses. Because reality is, in the traditional sense, many of them are not reflective of what courses are today. But again, it comes back to the question, what is good education and what are good outcomes? Is it always the completion of a course and a degree? Okay, I'm going to let you get away with that answer Sorry. without... Uh, <laughs> right. Does anybody, since he's got in, do you want to comment on that or not? I mean, Very I, I, think we, I think we agree on this, although I think yet again we are sort of questioning profoundly the value of expertise. I mean, one of the reasons why courses are bundled that way 
is because there might be some sense in a certain progression of content, of challenges that uh, may or may not be useful. We should be questioning it, but we shouldn't be completely throwing it out just because now it's suddenly possible to take it in 10 minutes, um, in 10 minutes bits, because as Morgas brought, isn't always best or better than a tasting menu. It's amazing, it's great to have it. But I think there's value in both offers in the, in the food market. Mm. Okay, even I so far am aware that we haven't had any questions or any comments or any contributions from any um, of our female colleagues during the course of this debate. So I'm going to take some questions now from any ladies who would like to ask one. Yes, in the third row here in the center block. Challenge taken. Um, Penela Ransko is my name. And uh, 20 years ago, I heard uh, Walt Disney telling me that for their, it wasn't online at the time, it was CD-ROM delivered material, learning material, they had the four C's that they had as a rep uh, requirement for their products. And the products were, the four C's were that the training that they did, the learning that they did, it was had to be connected to the real world. Well, you got that in the MOOCs, right? And it had to be user controlled. Well, let me see if I can get the third one. It had to be, I can't remember the third one at the moment, but never mind. The fourth was it has to be emotionally challenged. And that's one of the major things with the reason that classrooms survive. It's not all the bad teachers we've had. I know we've had some of those but the teachers that challenge me emotionally. And I'm asking, uh, what proof is there that the MOOCs will challenge and keep challenge us emotionally because then it's a winner. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to address that to anyone in particular or do you want a quick comment from both sides? Well, from now on, Pierre is my favorite, so go on. <laughs> Don't talk about Santa Claus. <laughs> You know, he's going to talk about Santa Claus again. <laughs> if, you if you believe there is no emotion and strong emotional challenge in MOOCs, you are wrong. Uh, there is a lot of um, intensity, and maybe that's one of the re Why, finally, it, MOOCs is a funny story, because we have this for many years. We have videos, we have online stuff, we have uh, assignments. There is nothing much new in the MOOCs. Uh, the MOOCs, uh, peer grading is something new, but they came with something bizarre, the strict timing of the classes, which is bizarre because learning on the internet is learned anytime, anywhere. Why do we force kids to upload the assignment every week uh, at the same time and so on? Because it creates some kind of social dynamics. It creates this kind of drama. Every week you take a difficult course, every week you have to upload your assignment. Of course, it leads to a bit of elitism that not everybody managed to follow this tempo. But it's like running the Berlin Marathon, okay? You can run the Berlin Marathon at the same time as these 20,000 stupid people. And, uh, or you can run alone tomorrow morning. You know, alone, nobody, you can run as fast as you want. What is easier, to run it alone? or to run it at the same time of 20,000 stinky people. Huh? It's easier to, to run with all these guys around you. It's social dynamics. We are, we are in this drama, and I think this social drama is very strong, actually. And that's maybe because they reintroduced this synchronicity in MOOCs, which was a good idea. Okay, jump here. I, mean, I think that's a great question, and uh, I agree with Pierre here that there can be a lot of, uh, I'm sure there is a lot of emotional challenge in MOOCs, and uh, the question I would ask is, what happens when there is? Because I know some of the great teachers from, who really changed my life, there were moments where I really, would have really loved to click an X and close the tab, because they really profoundly challenged me, and I wanted to look away and I couldn't, and the reason why I didn't wasn't because I particularly loved how I felt and what they were saying, but because I was in a room and I was in an institution and there were other people around me, and so there was a social environment, as Pierre was saying, that held me 
in that discomfort long enough so that I could shift my sense of meaning. They didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, you've not taken a MOOC, so shut up. They say, well, let's think about this together. And why haven't you? They showed compassion. They didn't show just dismissal. And, uh, and the question for me is, what, what would have happened to me if I could have just clicked, closed the tab and say, this MOOC is stupid, I'm not going to click like, leave a trolling comment on the internet and move on? Okay, more questions or comments? Yes, the lady there in the third row, I think. And there. There's the mic. I'd like to ask the two speakers who have taken uh, MOOCs um, to share their personal experience. Can you if, just tell uh, us your, your uh, name and where you're from? Edith Elikin University. I would like to ask them to share a personal experience of a MOOC that they have completed. No, like Jean Perrault, I have not completed a MOOC. And um, I would say, if you were wanting to invest uh, in McDonald's, would you go to someone who could uh, analyze the market data or who really liked eating Big Macs? <laughs> uh, I think there's a danger in talking just to enthusiastic participants. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it, I would agree if we were just enthusiastic participants. Um, I, I think what you will find in all of the MOOC providers that there is a large group, and that's why I was talking about a federated model of involved universities who engage with each other, criticize each other, and there are many, many critics in our own group of MOOCs, and we continuously strive to improve them. You know, I could tell you many personal stories of MOOCs that I've completed, but let's do that some other time. And, and just a short story, please. No, and short... My question was not for the ones who have not completed the MOOC yeah. that we've established. My question was really for the ones who are the strong advocate for the MOOCs. Please share one of your personal experience of one MOOC you have completed. You want to go back? I did, I did not complete the MOOC I started because I fell in love with the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me... Jonas, have you, Jonas, have, I mean, I'm, now, I'm cur now I'm curious, have you completed one? Yes. Yes, you have. I, I have completed, completely completed, and actually got certificates in three MOOCs, right. and I've taken about literally a hundred. Um, but taken mm. means I've enrolled at Coursera, at Udacity, at edX, at Iversity, and others, and started to take them or taken them, not because I ever had the intent to complete them, but because I wanted to learn something new. To me, it was similar to picking up the magazine and reading about a new topic, doing some research, and that's what I wanted to engage in. So to me, that is still a positive learning outcome. It's not what we should strive for or what we should aim for, but we shouldn't also diminish it. Does anybody, has anybody, uh, does anybody want to say anything about a MOOC that they have uh, undertaken or completed? How many people actually have actually um, taken a MOOC? And how many have completed a MOOC? Right. Creating counts. Yeah. Well, does, would anybody like to um, talk about their experience brief, briefly on this? Yeah. Back there, the gentleman there in the blue shirt. Yeah. Okay, my name is Yanis Angelis. I'm coming from Greece. And I'm a heavy mooker, so uh, in terms of the training, so I have uh, finished uh, uh, mainly I work with Coursera, and I'm very disappointed that there are no Coursera uh, representatives here in this uh, room, probably, and in this Congress. Um, I have finished three uh, MOOCs, and I have dropped uh, dropped off around 23, so I'd contribute to the drop off rate as well. Uh, I'm, a work, I'm, I'm, I'm working and uh, I, do my, I do the MOOCs during my free time, which starts at an, around 9 o'clock in the evening after my kids go to sleep. So, um, I would like to say uh, a little bit, I have also kept some notes in my cards. I would like to go like Crispin did, so I have some cards, but I just have two cards only. And uh, I would like to be a little bit provocative, saying that um, this shaking of the academic world uh, uh, because of the MOOCs, 
it, it resembles to me like uh, a couple being in light crisis. And from psychology we know when we are in crisis, uh, the first thing we do is avoid. So then I really understand people that they uh, speak against MOOCs, that they have not taken any MOOC. And the second is blame. And then um, if I go to the other side, which is uh, the people that they fall in love, it's the other couple. And then from psychology again, we have the phenomenon of uh, uh, projection and the phenomenon of confluence. So, you know, people in love, we always say we. So, me and my MOOC, we are doing this, we are in love, and <laughs> so... <clears throat> and um, I'm coming from a country uh, that we invented drama. And I see a lot of... of, of yeah. I see a lot of drama here, and also Pierre mentioned that. And uh, um, also from my uh, psychology supervising groups, uh, I can tell you that they came with a feedback to me, and they say, Yanis, when you are dramatic, we cannot listen to you anymore. Just see if you can be somewhere in the middle ground where you can have really ground and we can listen to you. And I think the MOOC story is more or less around this, my personal story. So there are two edges, but I think that uh, uh, we can really bend over in the middle and see what we can profit from MOOCs or not. So now regarding my personal experience, just to finish, I would like to say that I felt so much connected to some of my teachers in the MOOCs and also to some of my colleagues that it was an immense experience for me. I was almost crying when I finished my Stanford course. <laughs> yeah. And I saw, I realized, oh my God, I did that. <laughs> and I felt that I was in the class and I felt that the teacher was in my room, just to make it a little bit wow. more that. <laughs> and, uh, Last comment about, we talk about, we talk a lot about socializing and all this uh, social aspect of the MOOCs. And uh, I would like to say to the people that they have not taken MOOCs that there is a, a strong self-regulation approach from the people that they take MOOCs. So people that they take MOOCs, they meet outside their computers. So I'm living in Frankfurt and in Frankfurt we have a meetup point of the people that they are following Coursera MOOCs and we are around now 72 people that we, we meet from time to time. Either just, you know, talking about boys and girls, either just talking about our courses. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. In the front row, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mustafa. I come from Jordan. This morning, uh, we listened to a very nice speech about big data. And uh, I think uh, Professor Giampero today, uh, in his speech, proved what is the difference between big data and small data. You asked a tricky question, like most of the politicians, uh, whether we like to come from our room in the fifth floor or sixth floor to be here together with you, or if we wanted to stay in the room watching this over the internet. I hope you will just rephrase your question, send it to at least 10,000 people all over the world and ask them, would they have loved to come here tonight to listen to this interesting speech or at least they would have had the chance to watch it from their uh, homes on the internet and just get all what's nicely said over the last uh, one hour. It would be much better, and I think you will have different answers to your questions. It won't be most of the hands raised. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, we're running out of time, unfortunately, so I'm going to take three more quick contributions. The lady in the third or fourth row down there with something red on, just inside there. Hello, Rhonda Bernard. I'm with Antalis in Paris, France. Um, I have a question. I haven't taken a MOOC, I'll be honest, so I, and I have neither a negative nor a positive opinion about it, but I have a question for the panel. Um, jean Piero asked the question, similar to what the man from Jordan said, he asked, does, um, since, you know, who would rather take this MOOC or nothing? You did actually ask that question. And then you said, we're now comparing the MOOC to nothing. 
Does it help answer the question to providing access to the people? And then you said, who, when did we give up? And then you said, does it help answer the question to providing access to the people who most need it? And I didn't actually get an answer back from the other side. So I was just wondering, do you have an answer back to that? Or did I just miss your answer? So if I understand you correctly, you're asking, is it better to provide access than not provide access? Essentially, that's what it boils down to. No, my question is, are we providing access to the people who most need it? And is yeah. MOOC part of that so answer? I, I, yeah. Because in, that in the fear question. Of, yeah, yeah in, in fear of sounding a little boring, but I'll make it, it happen in 30 seconds. Um, if you look at the statistics, and I assume they're very similar for other MOOC provider, 70% of our users come from outside of North America in, in general. Sometimes it's higher. Out of those 70%, another 50% come from what we consider developing nations. So the short answer is absolutely those people, predominantly the people who take MOOCs, come from places where they don't have access to those educational resources in principle. That's again why MOOCs are a wonderful tool. They're not the solution, but they're a wonderful tool. Okay. Two more. Yeah, one lady at the back. Alicia, I think. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Alicia Mitchell. Uh, you're saying that uh, MOOCs give access to people who live in countries that don't have the resources to access these uh, quality education. But how does it give access to somebody that lives in a village that doesn't even have electricity? That is, is a really good and important question. So, um, and I can, it's certainly not, we haven't resolved that issue. What we're doing is right now, and, and uh, with, together with other MOOC providers, we're working together with countries and state departments um, of those countries to provide access places. So in the US, we're working with the state department to provide access to MOOC courses in places where people can get together. So to resolve some of the access issue. But in the short term, we, as MOOC providers, won't resolve the access issue. Um, you know, okay. where there is no electricity, we can't resolve that, but we're working on it. Right. Our final question in the front row there. Hi, Norman McLeod from the Naturalist Museum in London. Uh, a MOOC has a definition, and a MOOC, it seems to me, is being confused with just online provision. So I would, uh, I would like to know from the panel just what is the difference between a MOOC and other types of online provision that can provide access to people in remote places? Okay, each side very quickly on that. Chris Bim first. I think how it's been sold to us, which effectively comes to a definition, is something that will disrupt higher education and provide a reasonable alternative to degree courses. Mm -hmm. You would like to comment on that? I think that's yourself. a misunderstanding. Most I think you misunderstood this point. Most of the MOOCs we do, we combine online students and offline students. We have 20, 200 online, 20,000 offline, and there is not this separation of the world. So um, I, I, for me, the MOOC is a special recipe where we combine elements that exist in online education. You combine them in a speci special way, which occur to be quite effective. In, in very short, MOOCs, from our perspective, are interleaved sequences of videos, interactive exercises, and engagement via social networks. So it's not simply a replication of some content. It's an engaged form of engagement. Working. I, would okay. that, I would suggest that the MOOCs are being defined differently by the different sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, perhaps they can address that point in their summing up, which I'm going to ask each side to do now. Uh, so, if I could first ask uh, those who are opposed to the motion uh, to sum up their arguments and to deal with some of the points that have been raised for the floor, and uh, very briefly again, and then we'll so, take a, a vote. I want to repeat the fact that the future of MOOCs is not written. We are going to invent together the future of MOOCs. And uh, I want also to answer the question of what the business model. How are you going to make money with MOOCs? The answer is simple. You organize conferences about MOOCs, and, and that's how you get money. So if you want to invent the future of MOOCs, come to the European MOOC conference in Lausanne in February. And the topic I want to stress is MOOCs after hype. If hype disappears, we are happy. 
Hype makes our lives difficult. Let's forget the hype about MOOCs and bring serious people around the table. We know that MOOC per se will not be good, will not be bad. We have to make good MOOCs together. So forget the hype and uh, so post-hype MOOCs will be the topic of this conference in Lausanne. Can you zoom in? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'll, Johannes, I'll, I'll, I'll just add one sentence. Standing still is not an option. Okay, thank you for that. And now for the proposition, to sum up for the proposition, for the proposition. Crispin, or are you, or are yeah, you going first? Okay, yeah. I'll go first. Um, yeah, there's consensus breaking out, I think, to some extent. Um, because w we've been told to get on board, uh, but there's no one here who's a greater enthusiast for education technology than me. Um, my objection is to MOOC specifically as they've been sold, which is massive, not blended. So, you know, we've been seeing that they're being applied in blended circumstances where they don't become massive and they don't replace universities. That's what the sale was. That was what the pitch was. And it's already failed, it seems. Um, there's some other things that have been raised. Um, access to education resources. My whole argument is what are these education resources? If they're just information resources, then they're not very useful. The resources that count of the interactive software. Pearson was recently saying that they saw content as code, not data. Activity, not information. That's the way we need to go. Um, on data, I think the problem is that when you just are measuring access to data, you have very superficial data. You only get rich data from interactivity. And I think the question is, where, is that, where are those interactive software resources going to come from? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I just want to add. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to add one thing um, to what Crispin has said, which is what we've seen here is the recurrent, like, have you taken a MOOC, have you not taken a MOOC? And I have to say, as someone who hesitated to come on this panel because I hadn't taken one, and the reason why I haven't taken one, frankly, is because I'm dedicated to face-to-face, -face, very experiential. I dislike the classroom as much as the other guys. Um, and also, I engage in various other forms of online learning. And despite all that, when I was offered, when I was invited to this, I felt a bit embarrassed and I thought I maybe shouldn't accept. And the gentleman there spoke about projection. There's also such a thing as introjection. And the reason why I accepted it is I realized I'd introjected a discourse that unless you experience something, you should shut up and get on with the program. And I think that's a very dangerous attitude to have in education because it's a fairly, it's an unintentional totalitarian um, kind of view that if you don't love a certain way, then you should uh, kind of don't, we you, still know, love you. you shouldn't speak about <laughs> love, or that if you don't want to eat a certain food, then you shouldn't have a, a voice about it. And I, what I've heard is, I think those of us who are interested in blended learning and want to sort of are, are dedicated to face-to-face -to -face are being framed essentially as, um, as being less dedicated to education, less valuable to access. And I want to say there's more, you know, there's more to be debated. The debate just doesn't have to happen among people who agree with us and use our same method. You know, this is in education. This is the kind of elitist attitude we've been trying to dismantle for the last 500 years. That unless you do behave like us and like the same thing like us, you should shut up and stay on the margins. And so that's one of the, one of the things that we think I uh, need to be to think about. And the last thing I want to say, I mean, let's face it, since we were talking about romance with MOOCs, and I think I completely agree. I think we all agree that the hype is not useful. Online learning is here to stay. But we also need to watch ourselves in the face and look at the reality. And excuse me for being provocative. The old, boring, elite universities kind of jumped into bed with young and attractive Silicon Valley. The kids got screwed. And now we're going to have to sort of pick ourselves together, find a way to talk to each other, make up, and find a way of working through that trauma and find a different way of getting along. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much for that. And thank you to everybody for their contributions and to all of our speakers. We're now going to take a vote. And uh, so I would ask all those who are in favour of the motion, all those who believe that this House believes MOOCs are doomed, please to raise one hand, not both, as some have been known to do. Right. And all those against? Right. I think 
that shows that the motion is defeated quite overwhelmingly. So, can, can I thank you all very much indeed for attending this debate and thank you on your behalf to all our speakers for their excellent and very informative presentations. I'm sorry I had to rush you and that we didn't have time for more contributions but part of the reason is that there is the online educa party tonight which is taking place at uh, 8 o'clock I think in the pavilion room uh, and there will be drinks and food and if you don't have a ticket already you can get one on the door and uh, I think that will be very enjoyable there will be music as well thank you all very much thank you very much